Good evening. This is Dan Masters, Fruitland Road Church. This is our Wednesday evening meal, as we call it. I'm glad that you can join us for this time. Uh, we're going to be looking into the Gospel of John, where we've been on Wednesday evenings. And tonight, to be honest with you, we're going to cover a lot of verses of Scripture. In fact, we're going to cover, if you put it all together, it's about uh, 70 verses or so of Scripture. So, uh, if you just stay with me here. Now, I'm wrong. Let me go back up on it. It's about 50 verses of Scripture, but it's still a lot of it. So, I'd ask you to stay with me. We're not going to touch on every one of them. We're going to just have to focus not on every word, but on the emphasis of every part. And I'm going to attempt to break it down into three sections. First, the motivations of many people who seek a relationship with Jesus. And second, the only true motivation that God will accept when we seek Jesus. And third, the results of both right and wrong decisions for seeking Jesus. I ask you, if you would, to pray with me, and I'll try to be as succinct as possible, and you listen closely, and we'll go forward. Let me pray with you. Father, I pray that you'll bless our time together. I pray that you'll grant us the peace that we need and the wisdom and understanding as we look into this section of your word so that we'll understand who you are and why sometimes we can believe we're following you and actually we can be going the opposite direction and then what it takes to really follow you so lord help us to see it help us to rejoice in it help us to make our our decisions based on your truth i ask you in the name of jesus christ and for his sake amen i want to begin then with this point the motivation of many who seek jesus let's just look at this major motivation that often comes out and I, let me give you the context. The first words of our passage start in verse 22 of chapter 6. And it says this, The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea knew that there had been only one boat. They noticed that Jesus had not boarded that boat with his disciples, but they had gone off alone. But now they looked and Jesus was gone. So the day before, Jesus had, you remember, he had fed the 5,000 and oh, they were so excited about it. They they, they decided that surely he must be the Messiah because of all this. And they decided they were going to force him, push him by, by uh, their might, their power, their desire to be the king of all of Israel. And you would have thought at first, my goodness, what a, what a wonderful situation. Jesus had come to town. He had 12 uh, followers. And now all of a sudden he has over 5,000 followers. And you would have thought, surely this would please the Lord. It would cause him to, to feel like, man, a revival had broken out and his, his kingdom was on the way. But as we look at it, you'll remember that it did not please Jesus at all. And instead, he went down and sent his disciples away on the boat from where they were in Tiberias up to Capernaum, up uh, on the Sea of Galilee. And now, we also see that he went off by himself to pray. Now, we might have to deal now with this hard question, and that is, why didn't all those people claiming that he was disciple, why didn't that bring Jesus pleasure? Why didn't it cause him to say, this is what I'm here for, to accomplish these people coming to the kingdom? Well, there's a reason. Let's move forward into the passage. I want to begin reading now in verse 24. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? The people had awakened and they found that their new king had disappeared. So they deduced that he must have gone to find his other disciples who he had sent to Capernaum. So they too went down, got into boats, and they went to find him. When they did, they asked him, when was it that he had left them? Because they, remember, they didn't know he had gone out walking on the water and all that. Well, when did he leave them and make it to Capernaum? Now, here you have to understand the mindset, if you will, of this crowd. Remember, as I've said, they were going to make Jesus king. So naturally, they were a little confused on why he was not all excited about that. Why wasn't he staying there with them and saying, let's move forward on this? Because what he had done, basically, was run away from them. And when they caught him, their intentions remained the same. We still want to make him king. So Jesus did not answer their presenting question. Their question was, when did you get here? Instead, he, asked their, he answered their real question, what was really in their hearts. Why are you not letting us lift you up to be a king? Why are you not letting us lift you up? 
Look down in verse 26 now what Jesus answers. Jesus answered and said, I assure you. Now, you know, in the, your, verse, your translation, it may say verily, verily, or truly, truly. But he says, I assure you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves from the field. You remember John writes, and throughout of John's gospel, every time he talks about the miracles, he calls them signs. And those signs are for the purpose of pointing out that he was truly the one God sent, the Messiah. But he's telling these folks, you're not looking at me because you saw the sign. We'll see that more clearly in a moment. But because I gave you something and it satisfied you. You were happy to eat. That Their mindset here, he's saying, you know, you're not really interested in, in what I showed you that I was the Messiah. Instead, your interest lies in what you can get out of it because you got something to, to fill your stomachs and now you're satisfied. You want more of that. You see, they had not humbled themselves. When this had happened, they did not get down before him and, and bow their knees and say to him, oh, you, you're truly the, the one from God. You're the Messiah. They hadn't gotten down and said, what can we do? What do we have to do to serve you? They had made up their minds simply they were going to make him king, even if he didn't want it. Why? Because he could give them something they wanted. Like so many would-be followers, they followed him because they wanted him to supply their physical desires with his great power. Now, when you think about this, you can see this in the life of so many people. I suspect that so many people's prayers, and I know sometimes this has been true with me as with others that I know, are not about seeking God's will. When we pray, we ought to be seeking God's will. But generally, it's not about seeking his will. Instead, it's about asking God to do our will. Oh, Lord, I want this. I want this. I want this. Do this for me. So many, me start, I'm sorry, so many people start out trying to follow Jesus because they think he's going to make their lives so much better. I hear people witnessing sometimes. Oh, if you come to the Lord, all your problems will disappear. If you come to the Lord, everything you've wanted will come into being. And, oh, you can you name it and claim it and all those kind of things. And so that's why they come to the Lord, to find that better stuff. And, and they believe that he's going to make their lives better, that he's going to uh, take care of everything. And when life finally ends, he's going to take them over to heaven. In other words, he is just the, the great magic magician who turns everything good for them. They never really reach the point of understanding that they need to seek him out of their need, not out of their wants. Now, you need to understand that. When we come to the realization that what we, what we need is a Savior who can save us from our sins and move us out of where we are like that, instead of saying, well, here's someone who can supply every desire of our heart, we need to be careful about that. And yet so many people make that decision based on the wrong thing. Let me give you an illustration, show you what we do. This is a political illustration. These days I tend to use a lot of political illustrations because we're in the middle of a, a political battle going on in our nation. How many voters do you suppose don't always vote for the best candidate, the one who can take our nation in the way it should go? How many times do you think that happens? I think more than we think it does. Instead of voting for the one who can take care of the nation, do the best for the nation, they often vote for the one who promises to meet their desires. If you notice how often politicians just aren't truthful when they're out on the, the trail to get elected, instead of saying, this is what we really need as a nation, this is what I'm going to do, they say, I know this is what you want as a nation, and I'm going to try to give you this as a nation. In other words, they try to get someone that will meet and satisfy the base. You hear people all the time saying, well, they're playing to their base. What that means is the base wants this, and so they're going to try to do this for the base, even if it's not the best thing. Many, many of those who get elected, rather than trying to tackle the hard decisions and make it a better nation, simply try to maintain their position, to stay in their place by meeting the desires of their base. So many people come to the Lord and they claim to, that he is their Lord and their Messiah and that they're after his purpose, when in fact, what they're really just trying to do is to claim their benefits of following him. You see, instead of really claiming him as Messiah, they claim him as the vending machine of life. Why, he is so powerful, he's so good, he's all these things, and if I go to him and if I accept him and follow him, why, he's going to give me all the desires of my heart. 
And here's the problem. That is an, an unacceptable motivation to receive Jesus. That brings us to our second point. The only acceptable motivation for seeking Jesus. Let me look in verse 27 down here. In verse 27, Jesus says, don't work for the food that perishes. In other words, don't work for the things that just satisfy you here and now in this life, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. In other words, uh, you ought not to go out seeking just physical satisfaction. You ought not are not to seek out the Messiah so that you can get the house you want, the car you want, the, all the other things, the health you want, all those. You're to seek him out because he offers you that which is better food, food that will satisfy you forever, not just for the moment or the year or the lifetime, but forever and ever. He can do this because he's the true Messiah and, and God has set his seal of approval on him. So what he's saying, that God has set his seal on him. In other words, I can give you the better thing but so don't come expecting the lesser things, what he's saying. Look in, in verse 28 then. Uh, pardon me, let's go 28 to 29. What God, or pardon me, what can we do, they ask, to perform the works of God? And see, all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, you need to do the right things. And so they're saying, well, what can we do? What is it that we need to do to perform what God wants us to do? And Jesus replied in verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. The people do recognize that what Jesus is telling them is that not what they want or not what they choose to do, but what God calls them to do. You know, sometimes we, we choose things because it's what we want rather than what God wants us to choose. Now notice this. <laughs> they don't give up easily. They don't automatically set aside their original idea, and that is that they want Jesus to give them more food. They simply changed their approach a little bit. Jesus did not say he wouldn't feed them. Notice that. He didn't say he wouldn't feed them at that point. So they're holding on to that idea. Instead, what he said to them was, they need to seek God's will to get what God wants to give them. That's important. This needs to be your motivation, to seek God's will. They're doing, so they're doing a little investigative work here. They, they, what is it that God expects, they're asking. And so they say, you know, what is it that we have to do to, to show that we're paying attention to God's work. What work do we need to be do? And so he, Jesus answers with a simple but very demanding reply. This is the work of God. In other words, this is what you need to do to please God, that you believe in the one he has sent. Now, what does that mean? You need to understand these implications, Jesus is saying. This is the work of God. In other words, this is what God is doing. This is what God is up to. This is God's purpose. And he wants you to be a part of what he's up to. He wants you to build his kingdom and to reap his wages. In other words, don't try to build your kingdom. Don't try to get paid what you want, but build his kingdom and reap his wages. This is the work of God. And then he goes on and adds to that, that you believe in the one he has sent. In other words, the work of God is to receive the Messiah to honestly believe in Jesus and let him guide you. Let him prepare you. You are to obey his commands. In other words, you're not to expect him to obey your commands. You're to obey his commands. Only then, only when you choose that way, will you be involved in God's work and able to carry out God's purpose. Knowing Jesus and making Jesus known to others is the work God intends for every person. So lay aside all the other things. Knowing Jesus and making him known to others is the work God intends for every person to have. Let me read down to verse 30 through 31 now. What sign then are you going to, to, uh, to do so we may see and believe you? <laughs> this is them. Remember, they just got fed. 5,000 of them had gotten fed out of five loaves and two fishes, and they were, they were all fed. But now they're saying, okay, you want us to believe in you. What sign do you want to give so that we can see and believe in you? They ask, what are you going to perform? Our fathers, and then they go back in history, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And now, 
Folks, what they're doing again is just another attempt to get Jesus to do what they wanted him to do, which is meet their desires. They had seen him multiply the food. They had seen him feed all those people, and they were willing, at least outwardly, to call him Messiah. But that apparently wasn't good enough for Jesus. So they're saying, what else can you do to prove your identity to us? And then they, they gave an example. They said, in the wilderness, during the Exodus, you remember back whenever God had delivered them out of Egypt, and then in the Exodus, at one point they became very hungry, so they prayed out, and, and God gave them manna, which was a type of, of bread from heaven, and it was manna that they could eat every day. It only lasted a day, but they could eat it every day. And you remember over a period of time, they got sick of eating it, even though that was what God had given them, they got tired of that. Well, they're using that example, and they said, well, Moses had given us bread or manna to eat, and if that was good enough for Moses to prove he was God's deliverer, why isn't it good enough for Jesus to do the same thing, to give them the bread? Just give us more food, they're saying, and we will believe in you. Actually, when we hear that, it's kind of easy for us to agree with them. You know, we want to say, look, it's true that when him fed them the first time, or when Jesus had fed them just the day before, they were willing to accept his Messiahship. So what other sign would make any difference? Why would they not simply believe him if he fed him again. There are so many people in our world today who claim to believe in Jesus and their claim is sincere. Now that's the sad part. When they claim that they believe in Jesus, in their minds they think they really do. Here's the problem. They're wrong. Why? Because they're claiming to believe in Jesus and then actually believing in him beyond just out of your own want. Is two, is, are, that's two different things. Just claiming to believe is one thing, and there's a lot of people out there who claim to believe, but really believing, and that is giving your heart over to them, are two different things. Let me give you an illustration. I'm going to use another political illustration. Let's say that you are a registered Democrat. I grew up in Oklahoma where, at the time I grew up, almost everyone there was a registered Democrat. Let's say that you are a registered Democrat, that you live in a family full of Democrats, that you folks and people around you talk about how much better Democrats are than Republicans. You argue with each other about the virtues of the Democratic platform. You do all those things. But when it gets right down to the time of the election, you choose not to support the Democratic candidate over the other party. At that point, folks, you are practically, that means for all practical purposes, you are not a Democrat, despite what you've claimed, despite what you've done. All your claims make no difference because your actions don't support them. In other words, you claim me all these things, but when it comes voting time, you vote a different way. Your actions don't support what your claims are. In the same way, you can claim to be a follower of Christ. You can go to church now and then. In fact, you, I guess you can go a lot. You can tell everyone is, that Christianity is so much better than all other religions. And you can honestly expect to go to heaven because of that. But if you are not, now hear this carefully, if you are not sold out to Jesus, if Jesus is not literally the foundation of every other thing you do, and you are living by his word, you're trusting in his forgiveness, and you're sharing his love with others who need him, your claim may not be legitimate at all. Now let's go on to the next part of our text, and, and maybe it'll help you understand why I say that. This is the, the point, the results of one's ultimate motivation for seeking Christ, the results of being right, the results of being wrong. Look down here. We begin now. We're all the way down in verse uh, 32. Now, we're going to jump to a whole lot here, so hold on. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. In other words, that, that was not bread that Moses gave you so you could eat just for a day. That bread came from my Father who gives you the real bread from heaven. In other words, that was just a shadow of what God was going to do. That was just a small thing of what he was going to do. He was showing them he could take care of them. And then he goes on, For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In other words, Jesus, he's the one. And then they said, oddly enough, Sir, give us this bread always, again, they're going back to their own desires. Instead of hearing what Jesus has just said, they don't fall to their knees and say, it's you, we, we accept you. And so Jesus answered very directly. Verse 35, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. 
I am the bread of life. I am the true bread. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Now, obviously, he's not talking about physical matters. He's talking about the true matters of the spiritual existence that we have. But as I told you, you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Now, that was a slap in their face. They had said they believed. They wanted to make him king, but he's saying you have seen it, but you really do not believe. Everyone, they says something important here. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. Now, what he means by that is this. Many people have a lot of different theories about that. But what he's saying basically is, you cannot come to me unless you meet the criteria that the Father has given. When, when your motivation is based on what God wants that motivation to be, you can come to me. Now, some people will say, well, that was settled way back before the beginning of the time. It may be. Maybe that's right. Some will say it was just settled right before we made the decision. That may be. The point of it is that it must meet the criteria of the Father. Only the Father, when he offers them something and they come to that criteria, does he draw them. Notice it says that. He draws them to the Son. He gives them to the Son. And then it is those are the ones that come to him, and he will never cast them out. Now let me go on a little bit. The will, and this is verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, this is how it's determined, those who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him or her up on that last day. Jesus is saying, if you come to me and you believe, now remember, we're talking about motivation now. If you come to me and you believe out of the true motivation, and let me go on, then you will be raised up. Therefore, the Jews started complaining about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they began to complain, wait a minute. Isn't he just a man? Isn't he the son of Joseph? And, and isn't Mary his mother? How can he say, I've come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, stop complaining among yourselves. No one can come to me. Listen, don't argue about it. Don't try to reason about what you think is right. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In other words, you can't come to Jesus on your terms. You can't decide whether or not you're going to serve Jesus or be his simply out of the, the way you feel in your heart. Instead, it must be God's conviction following you very strongly. That's very important. You have to have the true conviction. Now, I've had people tell me all the time, well, when I was 12 years old, everybody was going forward. All the other kids were going forward. And so suddenly I thought, well, I, I need to go forward too. And they say, but I'm not sure I was really convicted. I just, I just want to be a part of the group. That's the problem. So many people don't really have the conviction of God. They simply want to be a part of what's going on. They simply want to join in and say, hey, this looks good. I'll, I'll do this. Or some of them are, are getting what some people call fire insurance. Well, I don't want to go to hell, they'll say, that's for sure. So I'll accept Jesus, and, and then I'll live my life as I want to. But he's saying here, you can't do that. The motivation must be real, or the Father will not let you come to him. You must be drawn by the true motivation, by what God convicts you of. Now, everyone who has listened and learned from the Father, it says, comes to me. Now, and hear that again. When you listen to God, and when you learn from God and that conviction comes on to you, then you come to Jesus. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who's from God. In other words, if you haven't seen the Father, you don't know the Father directly, but indirectly when his conviction comes on you, you come to the Father. And he goes on, says verse 47, I assure you, anyone who believes has eternal life. And remember, these people are claiming they believe, but he's saying to them, you don't really believe. If you really believe, you have eternal life because I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. But this, he's talking about himself, is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone who may eat of it will not die. He says, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread I will give you for the life, uh, for the life of the world is my flesh. Now at this, the Jews begin to argue among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
You know, one of the earliest arguments against, against Christianity by its critics were that they said, these people are cannibals. They had heard about this statement that Jesus said, you must eat my flesh, drink my blood. They didn't understand it either. And so I said, well, they're talking about it, going out and being cannibalistic. Now, to us, that sounds silly, but they really believed it. And he, these people here didn't understand it. How can this man say, give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I in him. Now, he goes on. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your fathers ate. They died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Some would say to you, well, here he's talking about the Lord's Supper. When we take the Lord's Supper, we eat the flesh and we drink the blood. You're right. He is talking about the Lord's Supper, but he's talking about the supper in a larger context. What he's saying here about eating the flesh and drinking the blood is that you must take into yourself the fullness of Jesus Christ. You cannot out here live beside Christ and say, well, I'm just going to be with you, Lord, and I'm going to live my own life and let you live your life, and I'm, I'm going to be with you, but I'm going to do things I want to do, and I'm going to expect from you to do things that I want to do. Jesus said, that's not how it works. You must take me completely into yourself. You must let me live in you. You must literally take my flesh, my blood. You must let me become you. You must die to yourselves. You must quit wanting to live out here by yourselves. You must live with me completely, abiding, living, uh, acting out through you. That's what he's saying. You must take that into yourself. When we take the Lord's Supper, we literally are, are, are performing that symbolically and saying that we are eating the flesh, we're drinking the blood because we are remembering what Jesus has done for us and we're again proclaiming that we are dead to ourselves but alive to Christ. And it says we will do that until the Lord comes again. In other words, until Jesus comes again, the Spirit lives within us and we are saved by that. That's very important in understanding what's going on. Now, I'm going to go on down now to, to uh, verse 60. They hear this, and this is what it says. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? And it is hard. When Jesus says to you, it's not enough to believe I exist. It's not enough to call me your friend. It's not enough to be willing to follow me around. You must literally Give yourselves over and let me live in you and through you. Boy, they say, that's a hard statement. You're talking about getting rid of me and letting you take over everything. And that is a hard statement. It's difficult for us in our, our normal human desires to want to just give it up and let someone else take it, even Jesus. It's a difficult. So, Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples, he's talking about all these people at this point, these 5,000, were complaining about this. He asked them, does this offend you? Well, what will happen if you observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? In other words, what's, what, if this offends you, what are you going to think whenever I rise up back into heaven? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. In other words, if you're living simply for your flesh, for living in the world, that's not going to help you. You must live by the Spirit who abides in you. The words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit, they are life, they're real, they're spiritual truths. You must accept them. But there are those among you who don't believe. Now, Jesus knew from the beginning all those who would not believe. In other words, Jesus knows when someone's going to come to him and when they're not. And he also, it says, knew the one who would betray him. So he said, this is why I told you, that no one can come to me. In other words, you can't come to me on your own desires. You can't come to me based on your motivation. You can't come to me, he says, unless it is granted to him by the Father. And the Father grants it only when your motivation is correct. Only whenever your desire is to give yourself completely to the Lord. And this is what it says in verse 66. From that moment, 
from him saying that. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. You say, wait a minute, weren't they disciples? Well, the word disciples means students. They were students of his. It's one thing to become a student of Jesus in the, that you're willing to listen to him and maybe follow him a little bit. It's something else when your discipleship comes to the place where you are turned over to him. Now, at that moment, when many of them turned away, it says, G G therefore, Jesus said to the twelve, to his, his most intimate disciples, his apostles, you don't want to go away too, do you? He's saying to them, it's possible that when you hear how hard this is, you may want to turn away. He says, you don't want to go away too, do you? And then it says in 68, Simon Peter answered, Lord, who will we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe that and know that you are the Holy One of God. We know it. It's not just a perhaps. Where are we going to go? Where will we turn? To whom else will we decide? What will our lives be worth if we're without you, he's saying. You are all that we have. So we have nowhere else to go. And Jesus replied to them, Didn't I choose you, the twelve? He says, I chose all of you, the twelve of you. And then he says, yet one of you is the devil. In other words, I chose you to come to me. Eleven of you had the right motivation. You came and gave your life completely to me. But one of you, even though I chose you, even though I called you out, you are the devil. Your motivation is all wrong. Judas proves that later on when his motivation uh, shows that he's not interested in God directing his life, but he tries to direct Jesus' life and turns him over for crucifixion. He makes a mistake, but he was not really, his motivation was wrong, so he was not a true follower. Now, All of Jesus' closest disciples were totally sold out. Now, they weren't completely there yet. Understand, this doesn't happen in an instant. But he knew their hearts. He knew the motivation. And he knew as they were going along, they would be more and more complete. Even to the point that, you, you remember Peter, whenever Jesus gets arrested, Peter denies him at that point. But he cannot live in that denial because his heart belongs to the Lord. And so they're, they're totally sold out. They had what Peter's saying, we have no other option. There's nothing for us. They didn't know it at that point, but their devotion was going to lead them to the point where they could go nowhere else. It literally, you know, in time, folks, they all, except for John, who lived in exile, they were all uh, martyred for Jesus. They were sold out to the point that they were willing to die for Jesus. Now, these people who wanted bread, they weren't willing to do that. They just wanted to be fed. Let me conclude this. What we've read presents a very difficult truth, but it's one we have to know and hold to. It can break our hearts when we read this, when we consider how many would-be believers are actually only part-time disciples. They're only disciples as long as it benefits them. When life gets hard, when Jesus demands that they trust and stand with him despite what life looks like and despite what life brings because they don't have the conviction of God's spirit in him in them they will fall away it's only when the conviction is so full that God's spirit comes in and settles in their lives the thought of that is painful at least it is to me it reminds me that the motivation with which we turn to Christ really matters. That which motivates us makes a difference. If we don't turn because God has convicted us, if we don't turn because God has shown to us that there is no other way and that it is absolutely necessary, then our faith is not true faith. If we turn to be a part of the group, if we turn because it is popular out in the world, if we turn because we're afraid of something, if we turn to him and our motivation is moved by anything that focuses on us more than him, then our motivation is not legitimate. The Lord's Supper, I mentioned a moment ago, does serve to remind us again and again every time we take it and to call us to a full devotion. We must take into ourselves the life of Jesus. There is more, no more to be said here. 
but time, I'm sorry, there's more to be said here, I have to say, but time won't allow it. I don't have the time to go farther. We'll study it more later on. But we must accept for now that God offers salvation only through responding to his call for full and complete surrender to his son, Jesus Christ. Now, there are those of you out there who may say, yeah, but he's already predestined that. I believe that's true myself. I believe he's predestined it. But he's predestined that our motivation is what will make it able for us to be saved or not saved. Whenever we choose to come to Jesus Christ, or let's put it another way, when we cannot help but come to Jesus Christ, when we surrender to what's convicted, that alone must be our motivation for believing. And that alone allows us to receive the salvation Jesus has for us. You need to think on that. You need to check your motivation. Look around and check the motivation of the people around you. It's only those who have devoted themselves, who have sold out and let Jesus take control, that are the truly saved disciples of Jesus Christ. For he is the bread of life. Thank you for listening. Let me pray with you and we'll be done here. Father, thank you for this passage. It's a long passage. It's, it's a little bit hard to understand at times. It even sounds scary at times. But the truth is it, it it, it, it's clear when we get into it that you're telling us that we can't come to you on our terms. We can't come short, uh, just for a short period. We can't come now and then. We have to come completely for always. We must take you into ourselves. We must let you become our source of life and our very life. And in that, we are true disciples. Help us to know our motivation. Help us to con be convicted of what is right and true and to follow up on it. Bless us all now, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you very much for listening tonight. Uh, we'll see you Sunday.